Hey everyone, Brittany with Brittany Hannon Real Estate. I am a real estate agent, coach, and investor. And today I'm putting my coach hat on to teach you how to do the new RPA. There was a new RPA that came out December of 2021. And today we're going to do a little bit of training to show you how we would fill it out. Okay, I'm going to share my screen and we are going to jump in. So today we're going to be using this house as an example, uh, a house in Oxnard that is 2.995 million. And we have some information on our MLS. We're not going to do any training on the MLS because every MLS is different. What I really want to take you to is DocuSign. Now I'm going to be using DocuSign. If you're using zip forms, it's the same basic thing, but just know that there are a few differences and we're not going to go over the differences of DocuSign and zip forms today. So first things first, when we go in here, we're going to notice that most of these sections are not filled out yet. So we need to go ahead and fill this out. So for our buyer today, we are having Mickey Mouse as our client. And Mickey Mouse is working alone, so he and Minnie are not going in on this one today. It's just going to be Mickey. And I have some of this information filled out because this is on my zip forms template. That is on a totally different video, so we're not going to deal with that today. Just know that this information was already filled out, but if it's not, you can go ahead and fill out this information. And wherever it asks for these same fields later on, it's gonna be automatically input from what you put up here. Now, one of the first things you'll notice is that when you get the RPA, it's not just the RPA. You have different disclosures that are automatically attached to this. So you're gonna have these disclosures. You can't take them off. They're gonna be included in your RPA and that's totally fine. Your client will need to sign these. So here's the first thing that we're coming to. You see here we have Mickey Mouse, but we also have the seller or landlord field that we need to fill in. Now, what we're going to do is I'm going to show you a shortcut, which is this MLS connect. So what I want to do is we have here, it's asking us for the MLS name. Generally, it's going to be the CR MLS one. So we're going to put that in and then we are going to find the MLS listing ID. So if I go back over here to the MLS, I'll see that the MLS ID is right here and I'm going to copy and paste it. Now, if we have trouble, we can leave this dash, we can remove this dash, we can do different things. I'm gonna say include the property photo just so we make sure that we are finding the right one. So this say, says they could not load the data for this listing. So there are a few reasons for that. I'm not sure which one it is. Let's go ahead and try some different things. I'm gonna remove this dash and see if we can find it. Still couldn't find it. Okay, I'm gonna put the dash back in and we're gonna go ahead and search on VCRDS. And there we go, it popped up. So every so often you just have to troubleshoot a little bit and see what's going on. Usually you're gonna be able to find it um, if you do a few different things. So you can see, here's all the information in here and I'm gonna say import. And it's gonna say, do you wanna replace the existing data? Yes, I do. And then it says it's been done successfully, great. So now here um, you'll see that there are these little asterisks. Now they, only have these asterisks because in the MLS, the agent put these asterisks for the seller. So I'm gonna go ahead and try and find the seller's name. Now, if you can't find the seller's name, it's not the end of the world. However, you wanna try and find it and try and put it in. Now, again, my MLS is a little bit different and I may have things that you don't have access to. If you don't have access to these, you can always do a title search with whatever software your title rep has provided. But what I have is I can click on this realist tax info and it'll pull up the tax info from the title search. So it has here the names of the owners. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy and paste one at a time and put it into our form. Now you can see that it's not, that this is the first name. And so I am going to just move that and make sure that the first name's first and last name comes after. And then I'm gonna do the same thing with owner two. So now anytime that we have seller information, it's automatically gonna put these seller uh, names into that field for the rest of our document. Remember, we're not explaining what any of this means. I'm just showing you how to fill it out today. Okay, so we have all of this information that was already input. You can see down here that it says test office and test agent. So for whatever reason, it didn't come across from the MLS. So all you have to do is go to the MLS and pull that information from there. Usually the MLS Connect will do this 
and not have an issue. But if it does, every so often it does, it's easy enough to fix it. Okay, so you see down here that everything is already input. And I just wanna confirm that this information is all correct. Sometimes it's not correct and that's okay. We can go through and change it as needed. Okay, so we're gonna go through, first off, making sure that the address is correct because that pulled from the MLS. Okay, so here we go. Now we are at the uh, residential purchase agreement and joint in escrow instructions. This is our RPA and this is what we really wanna focus on. So we're gonna go ahead and change the date first and foremost to today's date. Now we have in here all of the information that was pulled already from the MLS. So again, we just wanna confirm it's correct. So if we can't find any of this information, if it's not pulling from the MLS for some reason, we can always go and pull it from the listing. So if we said the assessor's parcel number, for instance, was not in here, we would want to go and pull it from the listing, which is uh, this parcel number. So it's the same number. We just want to confirm that. Yes, it is. Okay, we're going to move on. So you have here the agency and then Keller Williams. So the agency and Robert Sandler, that is the seller. You want to make sure that these are checked. When you check the seller, it's going to check both of these. If this agent was also with Keller Williams West Ventura County, we would want to check this box saying both the buyer and seller are the brokerage firms. That would be the dual agency. Now, because that's not the case here, I want to make sure to change it back. Let me unclick that. Change it back to the seller and make sure you're clicking on the buyer. All right, so what we have here is this is the grid that we're gonna fill out. This is where most of our information is gonna go into. So our purchase price, let's see, what was the purchase price? The purchase price was 299, well, the list price was 2995. So let's go ahead and offer the list price, 2,995,000. And we're gonna say this is not an all cash offer, although if it was, this is the button we would do be pressing. Now close of escrow, when do we want it to close? Now this is something that we definitely recommend you putting a date and it's not wrong if you put however many days that you want it to close. So if you want a 30 day escrow, a 21 day escrow, those are really very common. You can put that. We recommend doing a date because what you'll see is you want to make sure that you're not closing on a weekend or a holiday because if you land if you're closing lands on a weekend or a holiday, it'll be pushed to the next business day and you don't necessarily want that. So we always recommend doing a closing on a Wednesday or Thursday. That way you have a few extra days to just make sure that it's going to close in a reasonable amount of time. This one says January 20th and we're gonna leave that because that seems like a good day. That is almost a 30 day escrow. Expiration of offer. So the default for this is three calendar days after all buyer signatures. If you wanna change that, however, here is where you would put that information in. Industry standard is three days uh, for the expiration of the offer. So we would just leave that blank. The initial deposit also called the uh, earnest money deposit is generally between one and 3%. This is the money that would go to the seller if all contingencies were removed and the buyer still decided to cancel. This generally doesn't happen because your contingency timelines are put in place to protect your buyer for that exact reason. And the RPA is designed to protect your buyer. So in general, this almost never happens, but it's a good thing to know to be able to tell your buyer that this is exactly the reason. So when we talk about the initial deposit, you can put as much as your buyer wants. If they want to put down 50%, they can do that. And if for whatever reason it gets canceled and the seller gets the money, the seller is only able to keep up to 3% of that money. So it doesn't matter how much you put down, anything over 3% is not going to go to the seller. Keep in mind, this almost never happens. So it's really just the amount of money that you want to put down telling your seller that you're serious. Because of this purchase price, we're going to go ahead and put 1% down. 
And you can see that it does the math for us, which is nice. So we are gonna put 1% down, that's about 29,000. And I didn't have to write this in, it calculated it for me. Over here, this says um, this initial deposit will be deposited within three business days, or if you wanna change that, you can, or after acceptance by wire transfer. If your sellers want something different or your buyers want something different, here's where you would write that in. If they wanted a cashier's check or something, something like that, this is where you would write that in. But in general, it's going to be the wire transfer. Here's where you would put an increased deposit. This generally is not typical, so you don't have to worry about this for the most part. But as long as this is not checked, we move on to the loan amounts. So right now, most people are getting one loan. And that is where this loan would come into play. Now, what you want to do is make sure you have a pre-approval from the lender that says how much they're going to be putting down, because that's going to inform this part of the RPA. So if, for instance, we said they're selling a house, they're going to have 50% to put down on this one, then we're going to say that they are putting down 50%. So 50% of 2.995 is 1,497,500. And that again is calculated on its own and it says 50%. Now the default here is a fixed rate and uh, we can also say or adjustable rate not to exceed this amount. We don't wanna put anything in here because basically we don't want the sellers to say if it goes over this amount then the buyers are gonna pull out or the sellers would be able to cancel this. It just muddies the water a little bit. So we're just gonna leave this blank. And we don't want to say anything about the points that our buyers are going to pay. That's for them to deal with with the lender. If there was a reason that where they absolutely could not make the deal work, that's what your loan contingency is for. And so you don't have to fill this out. You just really want to make sure that you're putting this first loan amount. Uh, the default is conventional financing. And so if you had something different like FHA, VA, or seller financing, here's where you would put that. And it would come with some other forms to attach. Ours is going to be conventional financing, so we just leave it blank. Additional financed amount. Generally, we don't have other finance amounts. But if that is something that we have, here is where we would write that in. And if not, we leave it blank. Occupancy type. The default is primary. But if checked, we're going to put either secondary or investment. And then here's where the cool part happens. This is the balance of the down payment. This does all the math for you. So remember, the balance of the down payment is less your earnest money deposit. So instead of it being exactly 50%, it's going to be 50% minus this earnest money deposit of 29000 So the balance is going to be 1.468500 for a total purchase price of 2.995. All right, here is where we're starting to talk about some additional financing terms. So if there is a seller credit, in general, there's not gonna be a seller credit that you're writing on the RPA. That usually is worked out afterwards. However, if in the MLS or in your conversations, you have talked about a seller credit for whatever reason, here's where you would put that. Additional finance terms, if you wanted to say something about uh, your buyer will pay a certain amount over the appraisal or they'll pay, um, here's where you might put your escalation clause. Anything to do with the financing of it is where this is going to go. Verification of funds. All of these are saying attached to the offer unless you put something different. So um, in general, you want to make sure that you're attaching everything to the offer. So your verification of, of funds Verification of cash is going to be, if it is all cash, you're going to be verifying the funds. Uh, verification of down payment and closing costs. All of these are saying basically that they have the cash to cover what they're saying they're going to be paying in cash. So that's going to be your initial deposit, your down payment. The listing agent is going to want to see that they have all these funds to cover that. In addition, a lot of agents have been asking lately for funds to cover if there is an appraisal gap. So if your client offers $100,000 over asking, they want to see that they have $100,000 in the bank in case this house appraises at the asking price. So just so you know, this is where they're asking for all of these things. And then verification of loan application. So again, this is your loan application, generally the pre-approval. So you have the pre-approval here. If it's been fully underwritten, you can put that. Um, and if they've just been pre-qualified. Now, 
word to the wise, you do not want to be submitting an offer if they have not been pre-approved. So you, so you want to make sure that they have been pre-approved, that they've gone through that process, especially in this market right now. Final verification of condition is to be done within five days of close of escrow. Assignment request is going to be 17 days, or you can change that if you'd like. And then here is where we're talking about the contingencies. So you can see here, most of the contingencies are 17 days. That is really helpful just because it can keep it all straight in our heads. It used to be some were 21 days, some were 17 days, if you changed any. So note here, you can change all of these, but the default is 17 days. So for your loan, it's a 17 day after acceptance. You can also click here if there is no loan contingency. Now, just a note, we don't ever recommend you removing the loan contingency unless your buyer is extremely clear and generally they have all cash to be able to cover it in case the loan doesn't go through. You don't want to remove the loan contingency and it's not necessary. Here's your appraisal contingency. You can also add here. Um, it says appraisal contingency based on appraised value at a minimum of the purchase price, or if you want to change that, you can say $5,000 over the purchase price or $5,000 over the list price or whatever you wanted to do, you could write that in. But the default is a minimum of the purchase price. And that again is 17 days. Now here's where some things have changed a little bit. So we have, um, you can click no appraisal contingency. But then there's a note and this note says removal of appraisal contingency does not eliminate appraisal cancellation rights in FVAC, which is going to be the loan. So if you are removing the appraisal contingency, you can't say it's okay because the loan won't go through so we can lean on our loan contingency. No, you cannot do that. They either are saying yes, remove the appraisal contingency or no, don't remove it. Now you can shorten the appraisal contingency, but you cannot remove it unless they have the funds and unless your buyer understands that and that's what they want to do. Investigation of property. This is your timeline to do uh, the investigations that your client wants you to do. Now they still have access to the property. So even if you shorten this inspection timeline to 10 days or seven days or whatever you want to shorten it to, they still have access to the property but it's not part of this inspection contingency. So if something comes up after they've already signed off on this inspection contingency, your buyer needs to know that they cannot cancel based on that. They can cancel based on the inspection contingency, but you need to make sure that your client is aware that they cannot cancel due to this access to the properties. It's not a contingency. Then we have review of seller documents, 17 days or five days after receipt, whichever is later. So they have time to review the seller documents. We have the same for the title report, um, common interest disclosures, like if there's an HOA or something like that. It's again, either 17 days after acceptance or five days after receipt, whichever is later. Same thing for review of leased or leaned items. So if there's a PACE or a HERO lien, or if there are solar panels, propane tanks, water softeners, uh, those type of leased or leaned items, that is going to be, uh, they have 17 days to review that. Now, if we remove the contingencies, here is the uh, contingency waiver. It's saying any contingency in L1 through L7, which is here, all of these contingencies, may be removed or waived by checking the applicable box or by attaching the contingency removal form and checking the applicable box therein. Removal or waiver at time of offer is against agent advice. So again, here's another part where as you read through this, you're going to see that there are a lot of times where it is protecting the agent. So uh, here's one of the ways that this RPA is protecting you as the agent. If you have removed any of these, then you can click on this and say the CR, the contingency removal is attached. Sale of buyer's property. This is if your buyer needs to sale their, sell their property and this purchase is contingent on the sale of that home, there uh, is a form that you need to fill out and that is right here. That's where you would check that. Time of possession. The default is upon notice of recordation, which is as soon as it's recorded and everybody is given notice, that is the time that your buyer can take possession. Now, if you want a little bit more time or if the seller needs a little bit more time, 
that's where we have some of these other um, time periods built in. So in general, we want to say yes, upon notice of recordation, that is the default. That's when we want to have time of possession. However, if there are different circumstances, we do have seller occupied or vacant units that we can click on. So close of escrow date, or if checked below, um, how many days after close of escrow, and if it's 29 or fewer days or 30 or more days. There are different forms to fill out, which is over here. If the seller is going to be in possession longer than 30 days or fewer than 29 days. But if they're gonna be in possession any longer than uh, close of escrow, then you would want to make sure that you're filling out these forms. If it's tenant occupied units, you would want to just make sure that you have these then to fill out, filled out and um, here is where you would mark those. All right, this next section is for uh, document fees and compliance. So most of these are forms that are gonna be given to your buyers. Seller delivery of documents, seven days after acceptance. So this is uh, the seller disclosures are gonna be given within seven days. Sign and return escrow holder provisions and instructions, time to pay fees for ordering HOA docs, three days. So these are more for the sellers. They're, you're just saying, so everybody is aware this is in writing and these default days are generally fine for that. Unless you have some other reason for marking a different time or day, then I would just leave a blank. Here is where we are putting in items included and excluded. You can see that this has gotten much more robust from the last one. So we generally want to say, yes, the stove always goes. I generally like to ask for the refrigerator unless it's spelled out in the MLS that it is excluded and then I don't try and ask for it. Same for washers and dryers. Dishwashers are usually included. Microwave, if it's built in, is gonna be included. Um, doorbells, video doorbells, security cameras. If these are on the property, you definitely wanna get this in writing whether your client wants it or not. In general, you want to say anything that is attached, you want to keep. However, if the, if the seller has already said that they want to keep it, they're likely going to counter this out. But all of this tech information now needs to be included because we want to make sure that it's in writing and that it's extremely clear for everybody involved. Now, of course, we're going to have um, above ground pools and spas. If that's in here, we'll want to include that. And these are just, I mean, it's just good for us to see these things because we want to be able to say, yes, we want these or no, we don't and make sure everyone is on the same page. Excluded items. This would be if in the MLS, it already says that there is a chandelier that's excluded from the purchase. You can put it here just so that the agent doesn't have to counter it out because they're going to, if it's included in the MLS or they should. Allocation of costs. Here we go. Okay. Most things in California, the seller pays for. So if it is part of the home, if it's a disclosure with the home, usually the seller is going to pay for that. So for our natural hazard disclosure, generally our seller pays for that and we get to choose who it's provided by. We like SNAP NHD, so we're going to say it's provided by SNAP NHD. Now, here are some other reports that we can list. However, if these are reports that the buyer is going to be getting, for instance, a home inspection and the buyer is going to be paying for it, you don't need to write this in the RPA. The less things written in, the cleaner it is, you want to leave this out because we don't need to let them know what the buyer is going to be purchasing themselves. Smoke alarms, CO detectors, water heater bracing, that is gonna be the responsibility of the seller. Government required uh, point of sale inspection and reports. Oftentimes this comes with a VA loan or an FHA loan. Sometimes they require certain things. So we're gonna ask that the seller pays for these things. Although sometimes it's going to be countered out and that's okay, we can work with that. But we do want to ask the seller to pay for it. Remember, this is all based on what your client is asking. Now, escrow fees, generally each pays their own. And so we're just gonna click that. And then we're gonna go with whoever is our preferred escrow holder. And then the other agent can counter this out if they'd like. Owner's title insurance policy, the seller is gonna pay for that. And again, with the title company, we're going to ask for our preferred title company. And if they don't want to do that, they can counter it out. And that's fine. County transfer tax, city transfer tax, the seller generally pays. Um, this already has it on here. So you don't have to click anything. But the HOA docs are paid by the seller. And then this HOA certification is paid by the buyer. Any HOA transfer fees generally paid by the seller. However, if there is no HOA, then we just leave this blank.
we don't need to put that in. Private transfer fees, if there are any, generally the seller pays for that, which is why it's listed there and we don't need to mark anything else. Now, again, we have a few more that we can write in that in general, we're not gonna write anything in. The home warranty plan, uh, we want our seller to, be, to pay for this. Usually, if we're trying to make an extremely aggressive offer, then maybe we're gonna say that the buyer waives the home warranty plan. But in general, even in this market, the seller is paying for that and that's okay. You're gonna click on your preferred provider and if they're not in this list, then you're gonna write it in. And what I like to put here, we've been told by some of our providers is that we wanna say buyer to choose options. And the reason for that is that if we put this cost not to exceed, let's say 650 and whatever we're thinking that they want is not equaling 650, it maybe equals 500. Well, now the buyer can go in and select the options that they want. If there are other terms of the sale, here's where we would put that. Now here we have property agenda and advisories. So these are only gonna be checked if this is um, a non-typical sale. So if for instance, it's a probate sale or it's a manufactured home or the tenant is gonna occupy, in those instances, then we would check on these. Otherwise, we're gonna leave all of this blank. Other addenda, only if these forms are required, we're gonna leave it blank. And then these that are already checked are already included in this RPA. So we don't need to check this. So if this is a traditional sale, then we're not gonna need to click any of these. Now, the rest of this RPA is just explanation. So we don't need to go through any of this. I'm not gonna go through this because you should be reading every single word of this RPA to make sure you know how to explain it to your clients and what it is. What I want to show you is when we get down to the bottom, there are gonna be places where you need to just make sure that this is filled out correctly. So let's scroll all the way to the bottom. So here we go. Here is the buyer's offer. Expiration of offer is going to be what we had specified in paragraph C. So in general, it's three days and we're going to leave it at that. If, we, if your buyer is an entity buyer, if they have a trust or a corporation or an LLC, then you're going to mark this and it's going to prompt you to fill out a different form, the RCSD. If your buyer is just a typical buyer buying it for their personal residence and you don't have to worry about this and you can skip it. Now, we remember we already have our buyer is already filled out here. And if there are more than two signers, you're going to have the additional signature addendum. Acceptance of offer, this is not for you to mark, this is for the seller to mark. If there's a seller counter offer, they're gonna mark that and send you a counter offer. If they, have, if they want to select you as a backup offer, they're going to have, there's another backup offer addendum. And if the seller is an entity seller, if they have an, a trust or an LLC, then they are gonna also fill out this form. But you as a buyer's agent don't fill out any of those. And then we have the seller's names here again. Now the rest of this you wanna make sure is filled out. And this information is pulled from my templates through zip forms. So if you don't have this information automatically, you may wanna go and update your zip forms because you should have this pulled on all of your forms, it should be the same thing. And then the seller brokerage information, this is gonna be what we pulled from the MLS. And this was giving me some trouble, so I wanna just make sure that this is the same email address. So if I go back to the MLS, it is not the same email address. So I'm just gonna pull this from here. Every so often when you pull from the MLS, you are going to get some mistakes. So you want to always make sure that this is correct. So if when you pull it from the MLS, this information already fills in, great. If not, this is actually to be filled out by the seller's agent. So you don't have to fill out this information if it's not already there. It's actually the responsibility of the seller's agent to fill it out. And then escrow holder acknowledgement, we're gonna leave this blank and escrow is gonna fill this out as needed. And that is the end of our RPA. We have everything filled out and we are gonna send it off to get electronic signatures. Remember, you always wanna make sure to save it. Now, because we're doing this through DocuSign, I'm not gonna show you right now how to send it off because it's going to be different based on if you were doing it through DocuSign or through zip forms, or if you were printing it out to have it signed with a wet signature. 
So I'm not gonna show us how to do that today. So that was filling out the new RPA. I hope this video helped. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll see you in the next video. Thank you.